These nine words might forever change your sports card investing strategy. Hello, and here we go. Welcome to another episode of The Jeff Wilson Show. There it was, a simple one-sentence comment on one of my YouTube videos that would shake me to my core. The comment was this, no highly sought after collectible ever started that way. Instantly, visions of 1952 mantles being dumped into the ocean and 1986 Jordans being returned to Fleer flashed before my eyes. I couldn't stop thinking about kids putting Babe Ruth cards in their bike spokes or throwing their tattered first Spider-Man comics in their book bags as they got onto the school bus. Now, this isn't an absolute rule, but it does apply to a lot of collectibles. It's the mystique of being disregarded at first that built their legendary status. Much like how Van Gogh wasn't appreciated until after he died, many of the most valuable collectibles today weren't sought after when they first came out. And the opposite is almost always true. When there's extreme hype about a new collectible release, it often crashes hard. You can think back to Beanie Babies for this, or more recently, Topps Project 2020, some WWE cards, some F1 cards, NBA Top Shot, V Friends, and many NFTs, just as a few examples. There's a lot to think about here when trying to predict what will be valuable decades from now. So Kelly, let's talk about this idea <laughs> that no highly sought after collectible yeah. ever starts that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you do think about it, there are a lot of really interesting things that you remember from your childhood that you just threw into your book bag. But like looking back later, you're like, oh, that was probably like, I should have held on to that. I wish Treat I had with a little that. bit more respect. I wish I hadn't opened the video yeah. game, you know, yeah. to seal their worth more. Oh, I yeah. Wish, I wish I hadn't. Yeah. I wish I had preserved the album cover of the vinyl record or right. or whatever it is over time, right? Yeah. Obviously cards are an extreme example of that. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, well, like I got, I remember got a vintage Barbie when I was mm -hmm. growing up and now looking back, I'm like, oh gosh, I like absolutely wrecked that Barbie. And you would, yeah, as a kid, you're thinking, oh, well, you know, the, the purpose of that is it's a toy. It's just meant to play with it. But there is, you know, value in something that has that memory that's attached to it. But let's, let's talk about this comment on YouTube because yep. clearly... It stuck and it stuck with you. It did. This comment, it was several months ago. It was just a, a commenter on one of our YouTube videos. I honestly don't even remember what the specific video was or who the commenter was. And I, I it, but I just remember I was just I, every, every time we put a new video out mm -hmm. on YouTube, I always browse through the comments right. just to see what people are talking about after the video. And I just remember it was just a, a, a regular video that we had put out. I was browsing and comments and I saw this and it mm -hmm. really, it really stuck out to me. Yeah. Like, wow. No highly sought after collectible ever started that way. And I just thought to myself, I'm like, there's a lot of truth in that. It's not always true. And we'll talk about exceptions to that. Right. But there's a lot of truth in that. And as I have been updating my sports card investor, my sports card investing strategy, my mm -hmm. philosophy about the cards that I'm buying, that I'm holding for the long term. And I've done previous episodes about that. And, you know, I've had a lot of different thoughts and a lot of guidance from Marshall Fogel and different things I've learned over the last five years. But but this concept, this <laughs> thought, this yeah. comment yeah. had some influence on it stuck as with well. You. It stuck with me a little yeah. bit. And it got me thinking, like, what? is maybe not highly sought after today, but actually could be in the future in the future. And, and conversely, what is highly sought after today that's being propped up by hype, right? Which we see a lot of. Oh my God, there's so much overhyping. A lot of. Yeah. And is that hype going to fade? Could that be worth less in the future? In most cases, yes. Yeah. So let's let's talk about examples then. Mm -hmm. So primarily, let's talk about examples of things that were maybe you know, in the past of, of when they were in, you know, immediate time relevance were not looked at as being like these potential greats, right? You know, the yeah. tops 1952 Mickey Mantle. Is one it's of the it's ones. a good one to start yeah. with, right? I mentioned that in my, in my opening. And so, 
you know, in 1952, that 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 baseball card set obviously is a massive deal today because the yeah. cards were larger. They featured they were they were color. Mm -hmm. They featured actual you know images like photography of the players. Um, and so there's a lot of of kind of uniqueness. The first first year of tops as well. Um, but when they were first created, there was some excitement when they first came out mm -hmm. but then tops continued to print and print and they and they put the different cards out kind of in different waves different series and by the time they you know were kind of deep into their printing and the mickey mantle cards started to emerge these cards have been out for a while the american public had kind of moved on to paying attention to football season and they basically overprinted for the demand that actually existed back in 1952 and so Topps sat on pallets of these cards for many, many years. All these unopened boxes of 1952 Topps that they were trying to sell but struggled right. to sell right. at retail. And it got to the point where these cards started to become older and older. And retailers just didn't want them anymore. They were on to the new sets and, you know, that type of thing. And mm -hmm. so eventually Topps is like, what are we going to do with all of these unopened boxes overprinted boxes of 1952 tops cards yeah because you can't sell them in 1953 yeah well, and so. they were trying to sell them all the way up to yeah. like 1956 1957 yeah. they were still trying to resell yeah. 52 tops boxes nobody wanted them yep and they literally loaded them onto a onto a ship mm -hmm. and they dumped them in the middle of the ocean they literally took all of their unopened supply of tops cards 1952 tops <laughs> and they dumped them in the ocean can you imagine today with how valuable, not just the Mickey Mantle, yeah. the Jackie Robinson, the Willie Mays, and so many famous 1952 Topps cards. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, even the the commons are, are still very valuable and high grade because people want to complete the sets right. and all that stuff. Can you imagine like back in 1952 and, and beyond them being so unpopular that it, you just they, dumped them they off literally the ship. dumped them in the ocean yeah this on but, it, it that's so so funny because you were talking about like this this object of importance to us today yes but to them wasn't an object of importance then just reminds me for some reason of like the old lady in the titanic who has the you know the hope of right the right the blue diamond yep and she just drops in the, and she goes oops but it's that one because like that necklace to her wasn't as valuable as all of us are sure. seeing that the value is there. It's well, the mystique like the same. has built over time. Yeah. And history repeated itself in 1986. I mentioned Fleer. You know, that's the, the 1986 Fleer is the most famous basketball set of all mm -hmm. time. And you've got Michael Jordan in there and the card that many consider is a rookie card. He also right. had 1984 star. Well, I'll talk about star in a minute, but in 86, 86 Fleer, many regard that as the preeminent, not just card for Michael Jordan, but mm -hmm. so many great players like Akeem Olajuwon and Charles right. Barkley and their first cards for so many of these stars. And it was so unpopular in 1986 mm -hmm. that Fleer would distribute the unopened boxes to sports card shops. I, I think they were, I think it was six bucks for a box was what they were charging <laughs> sports card shops. 36 packs, $6 <laughs> was the cost of the sports card shop. And the sports card shop could not sell these things. I mean, they couldn't even sell them at 50 cents a pack. They couldn't sell them. And so, so Fleer offered to buy the unsold boxes back from sports card shops. So sports card shops were literally packaging up the boxes of Fleer basketball that they couldn't sell and shipping them back to Fleer to get a $6 refund yeah. on the box. That's so unbelievable to think about <sighs> today when this is known now as like the most regarded, most sought after basketball set of all time. I was a kid, I was collecting cards in 1986, but just like all other kids in 1986, we were all buying baseball. Yeah. So we were all buying 1986 tops with a big black border on top mm -hmm. and, and continue that pattern in 87 and 88. No one was paying any attention to, to basketball cards. And of course, you know, fast forward, you know, 35 years later and, and it's just you know, amazing how you're definitely not getting that box for six bucks no. anymore. <laughs> no, I, well, what's ironic is I own two of the boxes <laughs> and I mean, those boxes consistently sell for over a hundred thousand dollars a piece. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, owed, I, I highly doubt Fleer is going to be buying those boxes back from you anytime soon. Did, I mean, but, they might offer me six bucks. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to sell at that. <laughs> oh, man. But, if you had a time machine. At Jordan's first card, which was the 84 Star Jordan, mm -hmm. which has become a lot of attention has been paid to that card recently because PSA started grading it. 
there's a number of people that consider the 84 star to be Jordan's true rookie, right. but it was distributed only in team sets, only regionally in certain parts of the country. It didn't, it, it just didn't have much mystique or buzz there. There weren't that many of them printed. It's mm-hmm. actually a lot less of them printed than the 1986 Fleer. Today, there's a lot of mystique and buzz around 84 star and these Jordans, and they're really rare right. in high grades. They're, they're rarer in high grades than the 86 Fleer Jordans are. And much rarer uh, because much... you think there's a lot of more stipulation going into it now because of the just the quality or the or the placement of the card as far as considered a rookie. Uh, you'd be Jordan. back then. No, I mean, like now when we're talking about the, the fact that the grading stipulations are much higher now because sure. of the card, you know, now being accepted by PSA, you know, get a it, higher grade than that now. Yeah, well, it was it was more so honestly, the 84 star cards weren't the, the they weren't printed really well. So the the quality of them wasn't great. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not a lot of people preserved them super well either because right. at, at the time there just wasn't a ton of buzz about basketball cards. There wasn't much buzz about that set. And so a lot of people got, I mean, they were giving some of the star cards, uh, they were giving away at like, if you went to the slam dunk contest, mm-hmm. you got a free pack of star, star cards. cards. And so it just, at that time, no one was really looking at that saying, these could be really valuable someday. Well, guess what? They're all really, really valuable today. Well, it's like a lot of the cards, you know, that that kids interacted with in their childhood that they stick in, you know, their their bike spoke. Yes. And they are, you know, you talked earlier about comics yes. being thrown in book bags. And that, I think that's really pertinent because you're, it's, as a kid, you're getting these materials and you're touching. These are tangible materials. You want to interact with them. Wear and tear happens. Yeah. But then now as an, as and no an adult. One, and no one was thinking... I got to preserve this because right. this could be super valuable. Now, fast forward to what's interesting is once you get to about like the the peak junk wax era, like 1989, 1990, 1991, 1992, when there was so much buzz about sports cards and particularly baseball cards that everybody all of a sudden was like, preserve, I'm going to get them. I, I preserve because yeah. I'm going to become a millionaire right. by buying these boxes of 1990 tops and sticking them in my closet and saving them for 30 years. Well, guess what? There's still an unbelievable <laughs> supply, an unbelievable supply of boxes. More inserts than you could ever imagine. I mean, just unbelievable number of boxes from like, you know, 89, 90, 91 that are still unopened, yep. sitting in the back of sports card shops, sitting in people's closets all over the world. And they're worth practically nothing. Most of those are worth absolutely nothing. But there was so much supply because everybody had the mindset mm-hmm. of this is all going to be worth something someday. Right. And that's what's interesting, right? And if you if you go back through history, a lot of the great cards, you know, started without people thinking this is going to be worth something someday, right? And 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 a lot of cards that have gone down in value in recent years were ones where everyone was really focused on the value and the hype and the ability to flip and thought right. it was going to be worth something, yeah. right? If you go back and look at the 10 most valuable cards of all of of all time, the 10 mm-hmm. most valuable sports card sales. So we talked about 52 tops and right. the Mickey Mantle and SGC 95 was number 1 currently as it stands, $12.6 million. Number 2, number 3 and number 9 on the list are Hannes Wagner cards. Mm-hmm. So you're going back to the, you know, 1909 through 1911, the T206 cards. Um and those cards, you know, there's actually a lot of T206 cards which have survived the test of time. There's a, a ton of those graded, but very few in good condition. And the right. Hannes Wagner card has a legendary story around it because it was the one where it was extremely short printed compared to all of the other players. And there's, there's, you know, you hear different reasons why, but a, the, kind of the prevailing story that people believe is that Hannes Wagner didn't want to be associated with with the sale of cigarettes and the sale of right. tobacco products. So when he realized he was in the set, he said, take my card out of it. So only a very limited number of his were ever made compared to all the other players. A lot more of theirs right. were made. But even so, like people were getting these cards out of cigarette packs. They were fun for people to collect, but nobody was really thinking about trying to preserve the condition. Mm-hmm. There were no penny sleeves or top loaders. <laughs> that didn't exist in 1909. No one was really, you know, a you lot mean of people. You, you mean you pulled a cigarette out of this box and you're not pulling also the card and be like, oh, I should keep this card it, really safe right next to my cigarette. Exactly. You know, yeah. and it's just like, it's like, it's like stickers, like Panini, you know, has had their soccer stickers yep. every single year. Well, a lot of the old soccer stickers can be very valuable. Why? Because people stuck them in sticker albums, right? 
And yeah. so as opposed to like, why would you keep a sticker preserved? Why would you keep a video game unopened? Unopened. Why, would, play you, it. why yeah. would you get the first edition, the very first release of Super Mario Brothers that, you know, as yeah. and, and, keep and keep it, it in the case. sealed? Yeah. But if you had, it could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars today. Mm-hmm. But 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 nobody thought of it at the time, and it, that's such an interesting thing. And once again, you compare that to, you know, the, all the hype that's happened with certain releases over the last few years, where everyone's thinking they're going to be valuable, and they turn out not to be as much. And a lot of the cards now, not every card is that way. Like as you go down that list of most valuable cards, mm-hmm. uh, number four of all time is LeBron James. Uh, one of his 2003 rookie patch autos from mm-hmm. Exquisite sold for 5.2 million. Um, that was a card that everybody was chasing in 2003. Right. And you've got Lucas Logo Man on the list, which everybody thought that card was going to be valuable. Um, you got Patrick Mahomes, uh, one of his rookie autos. Everyone, every, well, Mahomes, Mahomes wasn't quite as sought after of a player right away mm-hmm. as lebron was like everyone knew lebron was the guy you know mahomes but he was still a first round draft pick he was still a right. high draft pick no one no one knew how good he was going to be but he turned out to be really good um but his cards were still popular mike trout's an interesting one because mike trout's on the list his yeah. super fractor the interesting thing about mike trout is that people didn't know that mike trout was going to be nearly the player that he's become he was not mm-hmm. a heralded star right. prospect back in 20 in 2009 he was not regarded in 2009 as the next ken griffey jr or whomever you know uh he, he was unhyped and his his greatness just kind of began to be discovered over the years much like Jokic in basketball or Giannis in basketball like guys who were not hyped on draft night guys, right. who are, you know, and so those guys are actually, actually kind of an interesting example of this in a little bit of a different way, yeah. which is guys who have, have really high record prices for cards, but their, their careers didn't start out that way. Like people weren't paying as much attention to them, but well, I mean, that reminds me of Tom Brady. Yeah. Tom, well, yeah, Tom Brady. You're right. Which That's by the way, it's kind of example. crazy that he's not on this list. Brady's not on the list of the top 10 most expensive card right. sales of all time. You're right. Um, um, yeah, it is just how many of his, you know, rookie yeah. auto card there are out there compared to some of these others. Wayne Gretzky is on the list. Right. Um, in the last spot on the list with his Opeachy. But I think his Opeachy 1979 and PSA 10, I believe there's only two. It's a pop yeah. of two, right? Yeah. And so one of them sold for $3.75 million. Um Well, when there's only two, you right. know, it's, it's scarcity. Yeah. Scarcity demands value. So yeah. I, I, I totally understand that. But how, so how has all of this then changed the way that you're investing in cards? Like when, when we're talking about like, how, how does one predict something that starts as being something that's disregarded and then to have the foresight and knowledge in investing to think that, oh, this is disregarded today, but it will be worth you know, it'll be one of the most expensive cards or it will be it will be in that conversation for this player or this player will be in that conversation in the future. I mean, again, we had this conversation last podcast. We were talking about how do you predict these? Things. Yeah. So how, how how does like this idea that, you know, these the most respected, and the most sought after cards are ones that people never sought after. And in the, in the beginning, how does that change your strategy then? Well, I'll give you I'll give you one example. Vintage on card autos. Mm-hmm. So I love collecting uh, vintage cards where the player has hand signed the card. And what's really interesting is if you go back and look at the total population of some of the most famous sports cards of all time that are actually signed by the player, mm-hmm. it is so minuscule compared to the total population of that card not signed. For example, Babe Ruth's 1933 Gaudi cards. Across the four cards, there are over 7,500 graded by PSA unsigned. There are, I believe, 27 mm. ever graded by PSA signed. So the same is true yeah. with all kinds of famous cards. I was just looking at Mickey Mantle's 1951 Bowman card, and the total population of that card hand signed by Mickey Mantle is under 20, whereas the total population of that card graded by PSA right that was not signed is I think around a thousand um, or somewhere in that nature. Uh, so it's monumentally different. Now, 
what's interesting is in the history of sports cards, for many, many years, autographing a card after a market like that was was considered to devalue the card. Yes. And no collector in his right mind right. would have a player autograph the card because right. it was kind of defacing the card. Right. Well, that mindset has been shifting and shifting and shifting some more. And now some of these card prices for the on-card autos do go for a ton of money. Right. And so it's not really a secret anymore. But when you look at how few of the autographed copies of these cards exist versus how many of the non-autographed copies of these cards exist, I still think there's room for the vintage on-card auto market to continue to climb mm -hmm. because they're just rare as heck. There was a 1952 Topps Jackie Robinson on-card auto, which sold at Heritage Auctions uh, a couple of months ago. I bid on it. It sold, I want to say it sold for like in the neighborhood of $160,000, 170000 And mm -hmm. I... I had a high bid. I had a six figure bid on it, but I didn't, I didn't win. I didn't get all the way there. Um, but the, like, there's only six of those mm -hmm. in existence, only six. And so your chances of, of seeing that card come up again for auction. Mm -hmm. right. Low. You, you might be waiting a your, while. Your chances though of also winning that card at sure. auction are low. Yeah. So I guess that, that that also becomes like the, the real test as a collector or an investor is like, how do you win a card like that? And yeah. like, where, where, where does your, where does the level start? Well, you gotta be willing to pony up some cash <laughs> today, but you know, that's the thing with vintage on card autos. You could have bought those real cheap 10 years ago, real yeah. cheap, real cheap compared to where they are today, five years ago, even real cheap. And so today, like, you know, a lot more people are, are focused on them now mm -hmm. and, and the populations are so low that it drives the prices up. But because the populations are so low, I still think there's room for those to go up in the future. So I'm still buying them. I'm yeah. buying them as I see opportunities to grab one. Okay. Well, with how uh, it's sort of shifting now to like a little bit of more modern, and we yeah. talk about vintage, but with you know how everything is hyped these days, and how there's so much anticipation with um, card sets. You know, I I see the guys in here that the minute a release is out, they're immediately talking about it, talking about the checklist. What's in the checklist? Yeah. Like what what cards can they see? What inserts? When it, what inserts are there? What parallels, etc. So like, with how much is in, anticipated with product releases these days, how can how can there be then room for this um, undervaluing of or underhyping of a card for that to it then grow value? It's really hard today, but it's not impossible. And I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. In late 2019, on the Sports Card Investor Channel, mm -hmm. I did a video uh, late, ni late 19 or might have been early 2020. I did a video called Soccer Card Investing 101. I didn't know anything about soccer card investing back then, but I mm -hmm. covered all the other sports quite right. a bit. So I met up with a guy here in Atlanta, Austin, who knew a, a fair amount about soccer cards. And so the video was me interviewing him mm -hmm. about how to invest in soccer cards. And he kept saying to me during the video and after, he's like, I think soccer cards have a ton of room to go up. And he was saying to me after the video, he's like, you should really buy some cases of eminence, like eminence soccer, which came out a few years ago, flawless soccer. He's like, you should really buy some boxes or cases of the higher end products. They're still not that expensive right now. Mm -hmm. Literally we did that video. And then like a year, year and a half later, those boxes were selling for 30, 40, 50 times, 50 times what I could have bought him for had I listened to his advice that day, like 50 times. <laughs> now we're talking about this, but boy, if you had a time machine. <laughs> 50 times <laughs> yeah. in, in like a year and a half. And yeah. so, you know, it, it's certainly like, I don't know. I, I don't know what the opportunity is today with stuff that's being made in 2023. And maybe mm -hmm. there's not one at quite as, as much like that, but like that was only a couple of years, only a few years ago. Right. When there was the opportunity to get in ahead of, you know, what was, right, was, was going to be flying under the radar and no one was really yeah. paying a whole lot of attention to it. So who knows where the market's going to go and what the next thing is. Mm -hmm. But I would be foolish to say there's no opportunity today right. because I would have told you back in 2020, I'm not so sure where the opportunity lies. But then we saw soccer go nuts. We saw UFC 
go nuts for a while and yep. that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Well, it's going to it's going to be interesting that conversation, especially about soccer and relating to a product that's been hyped from the beginning, right? So how do you anticipate or how do you judge then a set or something that's been hyped from the beginning because now with you know, it's not officially inked in pen, but with this whole conversation about Messi coming to MLS, there's going to be a change in the pro way product is possibly sure. produced for MLS. And then you're going to have a lot of hype from the beginning. So let's talk about that opposite. Let's talk about when something's hyped from the beginning, from the very beginning. So if Eminence soccer would have been hyped from the very beginning, would you have seen the same trajectory? Do you, would you think you would have seen something that would have had that 50 times value that it did? Oh yeah, no, absolutely not. Yeah. So when something's high from the beginning, it's really hard for it to go up in price. And that's true, honestly, for like a player, mm -hmm. like whoever the number one rookie is. Zion Williamson. Chasing his car. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's so many examples yeah. of that, right? Mm -hmm. Over the last five years. Um, and and it's really hard for anybody to live up to that billing of being the number one draft pick. Or, but then likewise for products, you know, it's really, really difficult. The problem is that if there's a lot of hype, mm -hmm. then you get a lot of people in it just for the money, mm -hmm. you get a lot of flippers. And that's what we saw drive the sports card market to crazy heights in 2020 and 2021. And then when it stopped becoming easy money and prices start to, started to fall, all the people that were just in it for the money sold all their stuff, got out quickly, mm -hmm. which all the supply, not as much demand anymore, prices came down hard. We saw it with sports cards, but we saw it even more with things like NBA Top Shot, and NFTs. Yes. And the reason why you saw it more in there is at least with sports cards, there is a strong collector base mm -hmm. and there is a, you know, 70 year history plus of sports cards having some value, right? Mm -hmm. And so sports cards were driven up by flippers and speculators in, in 2020 and 2021, and then they fell back down, but they started then to finally stabilize when you got kind of to the level that the collectors were like back in it again, the right. collectors were like, all right, prices have gotten back sensible. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're collecting back in we're, the game, back in the game again. So the collector base kept it from completely crashing. Right. NBA top shot didn't have that collector base or to the same degree. There are some people that collect NBA top well, shot. It's, love it, it's hard when but, something, Pushes because that, it's, br it's brand new. Yeah, it doesn't have the history. That well, it's also has. when you're talking about something being overhyped, you're talking about this influx of yes. traffic. That's hard to have like a, a a length of time to where a collector base can be grown. Yeah, I mean, like that's you're pushing everybody there all at once. Yep. And then and then you know people wait to see what happens. But when you have that sub, that short amount of time, it's hard to get become sticky. Yeah. You know. Yeah, hundred percent, a hundred percent, and so. You saw, right. And so you saw there were a bunch of people in it that were just in it for the money. Mm -hmm. And so you saw it drive the price of NBA Top Shot and different NFT collections up to absolutely crazy heights. And then when they started to come down, every no one wanted to be the last one holding the bag. Right. So everybody just started sell, sell, sell because they didn't have the emotional attachment to it. They didn't yeah. care about it. Yeah. They were in it for the money. And so it all came crashing down hard because people just wanted to get their money out and move on to the next thing. And that existed with those products specifically because it was all hyped from day one. Mm -hmm. You know, if they had gotten off to kind of a slower, you know, if, if they had if, if many, many years had gone by and a collector base had kind of built up around them, right. then it would have been a little more sustainable. But that that wasn't the case. There actually are some like NFT projects like CryptoPunks, which which were actually the originals. And there were some people that were holding those, those you know, CryptoPunks in 20, 18 and 2019 because they they liked them and they cared about them. so there actually was a collector base there right but then the speculators drew drove it to the moon and then it it you know it came it came back down again hard and um you know we yeah we've seen that with a lot of those types of things so you've got to be the lesson there really is you know anything that's really hyped out of the gate mm -hmm. it's going to be hard for that to maintain its value uh, in the long term, and and oftentimes, you know, the opposite is true. Where it's just gonna, you know, just yeah. unfortunately fall off the cliff at some point. All right, so let's let's go to a fun segment then, because let's talk about <laughs> this lovely com this lovely conversation about things being overhyped. So if you we're gonna do like a would you rather, okay, right? So a would you rather of an overhyped 
product or or card. Um, and these are primarily products. Some of it's like an actual like like an NFT, right? So let's let's start with the first one. So I've got a Johnny Menzel rookie card or Ryan Leaf rookie card. Oh, interesting. Okay, so these guys were overhyped because of their own status, right? Yeah. These guys were like Ryan Leaf was a top draft pick, unbelievably, because Peyton Manning was on the draft board. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, um, uh, but, but, you know, there was a lot of people who thought Ryan Leaf was, was going to be the better of the two. Um, and then Johnny Manziel was, you know, so, so many people in love with this guy coming out of college and so hyped and both of them just had just (laughs) crashed hard for different reasons. Yeah. There's actually a lot of similarities between those two and their personalities and their brashness and some of the things that happened to them after their playing career and, there's a lot of stuff there. I, I mean, I guess I'd have to, if I could, if I could have one of their two cards, I, I guess I'd rather have Johnny Manziel because, um, he's a more recent, you know, mm-hmm. he, he's almost a legend because of how crazy he was and how his yes. career was a failure, mm-hmm. which Ryan Leaf is kind of to, to a degree as well, but Manziel's just more flamboyantly out there. Yeah. So I guess, I guess I, I guess I go all in on, uh, <laughs> Johnny on, on Johnny money there. Good. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Zion Williamson, national treasure RPA. We love that one. Uh, and, or John Morant, national treasures RPA. Talk about a fall from grace for both of these guys. Oh gosh. Yes. Different, different reasons, but like, it's hard to think about how excited Everybody in the sports card world, myself included, was about Zion in 2019 oh, about yeah. Zion and about Ja, mm-hmm. and how both of their careers have turned out to this point. Mm-hmm. You know it, that that's it's hard to think about because everybody like that was such a pivotal year with many people getting into collecting, and those were the cards that a lot of people were chasing for the very first time. And oh, um, <laughs> I don't know, sigh. like it's a heavy sigh. I don't know. I, I I still have some long-term hope for both of them, but maybe maybe I'm being overly optimistic. Zion is a special player when he can stay healthy yep. and be in shape. Yep. And it just has been so little that yep. now you just have to wonder if he's ever going to be able to put forth a full season and and actually live up to his promise. Right. Ja has proven he could be a very special player and a difference maker. His problems are off the court. Yes. He seems to have some real problems there. I guess I'm going to go with Ja mm-hmm. because my hope is that he could, he can, my hope is he can get his, his act together mm-hmm. on the off the field stuff. Right. And his on court stuff. Well, he's is, got a, he's got a lot of proven. He's got a lot of time right now to yeah. figure, figure that out. So I've got two more scenarios. Okay. Um, and these are, uh, types of cards. Okay. So WWE cards yeah. or F1 cards. Yeah, both of these both of these releases, the first F1 release from Topps Chrome mm-hmm. 2020 and then the first the first recent WWE release, the first Prism WWE release, both came out of the gate super hot. Prices went berserk on the secondary market. Prices have come down hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, over the course of the last many months on both of these I, you know, I'd say of these two, F1 has more long-term sustainability. There, There is a strong collector base around F1 who truly mm-hmm. love the cards. I've met a lot of people who are big F1 collectors. And, and WWE has a collector base as well. It absolutely yeah. does. But F1 has the global appeal. Yep. The sport is is certainly on a global level, like way more It's got more backing also as in like Netflix. It has, does. Yeah. Yeah, so I'd go, I'd go, I'd go F one. I actually think F one cards, you know, the first year of F one cards, I actually think, you know, some of those are going to hold up long term. I mean, especially your, your, you know, Verstappen and mm-hmm. Lewis Hamilton and those kind right. of cards, right? Um, so you know, WWE. I, I know there's fan interest around certain guys. You had the Rocks card sell for <laughs> a gazillion dollars, but I'll, I'll go F one between those. Okay. two. Okay. All right. Last one. Last one, <laughs> and. uh, this is gonna be the funner of the the, the ones that we've done. Uh, NBA Top Shot or V Friends. Oh boy, uh, <laughs> yeah, both went up. <laughs> let's, and let's talk about this. Joke. Both have come down. <laughs> you know, so oh yeah, I don't know where to go with that. Um, NBA Top Shot. I don't. I I man, I don't. I don't know. 
th that has lost that project has lost so much hype compared to the amount of hype that was yep. that existed for that project yep. a couple of years ago. Can it ever recover and get back? I mean, I don't think it's ever going to get back to the levels of excitement that was around that pro project for a while. But talk about a company that just blew up out of the stratosphere, but then kind of have just came crashing back down to earth. It's pretty yep. wild. Yep. Um, Feels like it was all within a year too. Yeah, it really was. It was quick. And then V Friends, V Friends is a little different because the prices of V Friends NFTs have come down in a lot. V Friends was connected to being able to attend Gary V's conference for three years. The first year, there was so much excitement and anticipation that mm -hmm. people were buying those NFTs for crazy amounts to be able to go to that conference. They were selling for pretty cheap, like the the tokens to get into the conference. Mm -hmm. We're selling for pretty cheap this year. There was not, it was not that expensive to get in. I mean, I think it was like sub $100 um, this year to get oh, into wow. the conference. Whereas I think last year would have cost you at least a few thousand dollars from what I remember. Um, so not as much excitement this year. Of course, you know, one of those has already happened. And then you got a conference again next year, but then that's it for the foreseeable future. Now, Gary may have those V friends turn into other things for people who knows, maybe try to build some utility back into them. Right. <sighs> I guess between the two, I'd probably pick V Friends at this point as like what is going to be a little more valuable in the long term, just because Gary V is continuously going to try to do things with those. Mm -hmm. um, so it's more about the utility then of yeah, the, of the product because of the yeah. utility. Yeah, I'd probably build some more utility into them. Yeah, makes yeah. a lot of sense. So, but yeah. I don't know. I own I own some NBA Top Shot, so I'm hoping NBA <laughs> Top Shot uh, rallies back at some point. <laughs> well, this has been fun. I mean, it's, it's been a good it's, episode. It's, you know, there's, I think the, the comment that was made on the YouTube, clearly it's stuck with you. We're making yes. a whole episode about it right now, yeah. but I think there is like, there is a lot of truth to like a lot of the most valuable things right now are, were undervalued yeah. and, and forgotten. So maybe, maybe next time you have something in your hands that you really love and, and you care about, just buy another one and preserve it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, thank you for watching. Make sure to check out the podcast version of the show on Spotify and Apple podcasts. Of course, we're on YouTube every week and follow it's Jeff Wilson on the socials, uh, Instagram, uh, TikTok, et cetera, where we post highlights of the show. Thank you, Kelly. Of course. We'll see you guys again next week. Take care.